he desired. The only thing that matters is this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and pressing toward what is yet ahead. To live with singularity of purpose. You know, that makes life a whole lot easier to live when you just have a single task. You just have to please God. But oftentimes we we are multitasking as it pertains to the things of the eternal. No, no, no. Now you, you, you can multitask in life and um, around your house and around your place of work. That's, that's good. But when it comes to the eternal, shut the corn down towards one thing. Yes. This one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. BBC author Sarah Rainsford writes this. And again, I don't know uh, who, who this gal is. But she works for the BBC. <clears throat> Russian President Vladimir Putin stepped onto the swaying deck of a miniature submarine. He squeezed inside the capsule, and the craft descended into the Black Sea. The purpose of Putin's excursion, people were told, was to view the wreckage of an ancient ship. Ha, ha, ha. But it soon became clear that archaeology was the last thing on Putin's mind. The craft leveled out and moved toward the Crimean Sea. We tried to, to, to move toward the Crimean coastal, coastal city of uh, Sevastopol. Its surface near a waiting yacht, which sped the Russian president to the seaport and deposited him on Crimean soil. It was August 2015 less than 18 months after Russia seized the Crimean Peninsula from its parent nation, Ukraine. At the time of the takeover, Ukraine had been making overtures to the West with the possibility of joining the European Union. To prevent such a move, which would impede Putin's ambitions for a reunited Soviet bloc, he had, he had not only annexed Crimea, but also infiltrated eastern Ukraine with Russian soldiers. His purpose, his purpose was to stir that nation, already reeling from political turmoil, into chaos. It was his way of saying, Crimea is Russian territory. I don't need an invitation. I can come here anytime I want in any way I want, and take what I want. Moments after Putin landed at Sevastopol, a BBC reporter questioned the legitimacy of the takeover. Putin replied, The future of Crimea was determined by the people who live on this land. They voted to be united with Russia. That's it. Voted <laughs> under the supervision of Russian troops. So let's show that next slide, please. Our, our slides are on. Now I say God, the, the devil has fought this message tooth and nail on about 15 different fronts since yesterday. You cannot believe how many attempts have been fought at this message. And we're even struggling with the, with the slide issues here this morning. But I'll be... I will, I'll be damned if I don't give this message. I mean, really, literally, truly. I'll be damned, I'll, I'll be damned to hell if I do not fulfill the task uh, that, that God has for me. So there's the Crimean Peninsula, this beautiful area in Russia. And, uh, and Putin took that over from the Ukraine, and then he took it over with the power of the next slide. Here's our little Russian bear. <laughs> and let's put up uh, Vlad. Let's put up the next picture of Vlad, Vladimir Putin. Putin began his career as a Russian KGB. Now, the KGB is the equivalent of our CIA, all right, the secret police. Uh, Putin began his career as a Russian KGB officer in 1975 when Russia was a major world power, second only to the United States. But incompetent leaders brought economic collapse on the country. Does that sound familiar to anyone? 
<laughs> Holy cats. But incompetent leaders brought economic collapse on the country, thus weakening the nation to almost third world status. Those of you who are my age and older, how many of you remember nuclear bomb practices? Where the teacher would say, get under your desk, get under your desk, and you hide under your desk because if a nuclear bomb, I mean like our desks, we're gonna save us, right? <laughs> but we remember these things. When Russia, you know, during the Cold War, when Russia was a great threat and you know Khrushchev was gonna was gonna nuke us, you know, and, and Kennedy backed him down, and you know, I remember those drills. You get underneath your desk in case there was a nuclear bomb that would go off. But then you remember how Russia just kind of faded into, you know, after perestroika and these things, Russia kind of became a, and uh, an also ran, if you will. Russia is ramping up. So Putin began his career as a KGB officer in 75 when Russia was a major world power. Through sheer ambition and elimination, and if you follow away the news, you know how the Russians like to poison their enemies. Literally, just they like to poison their food, the drinks that they take, the opposition against them. One of their famous ways of getting rid of people is just to poison them. Through sheer ambition and elimination of political enemies, Putin is now in his fourth term. They're only supposed to serve two terms, but he just says, I'm Vlad, and I'll, I'll serve as long as need be. <laughs> He's now in his fourth term as president with no end in sight. So, you know, why do I talk about this annexation, if you will? Yeah, all it was, they, they just, they, they conquered right. them. They so imagine, you know, we're, we're, we're part of the United States, and the largest the largest state in America is, is Texas. Well, Alaska is, but it's, it's way up north. But of the contiguous states down here, Texas is the largest state. Russia is the largest of the federation states. You know, there's all these stands that are there. Russia is the largest one. And they took over, they took over this portion of the Ukraine called the Crimea Peninsula. So imagine if Texas, the largest state, says, I want, I want Illinois as part of Texas. Well, as far as I'm concerned, they can have Illinois, you know. I want, I want Minnesota. As far as I, they can have Minnesota. You know, this is what, this is what Putin did. They, this is a, a heavy tourist area. There's, there's industry there. And he just simply conquered them. He just took it right from uh, the Ukrainians and says, this is now mine. And so this morning I want to preach to you this Next segment on this series, Signs of the Times, The End is Near, and today's subtitle is, The Russians Are Coming. <laughs> the Russians Are Coming. And we're going to look at Ezekiel 38 and 39. I encourage you to open your Bibles, because that's going to be the great gist of where we're going today. It's interesting, where's Brother Jim? Brother Jim Prince uh, at the morning prayer service on Friday was saying how he was reading Revelation chapter 16 and talking about global warming. And he made the comment that God controls global warming. And it's true. Yes, he does. I challenge you to look at Revelation 16. And the Bible says that God, God sent scorching heat right. upon right. the earth. Right. Yes. And Ezekiel speaks. 20, 2,700 years into the future to Revelation chapter 16, the same essential thing. But Ezekiel 38, 39 will be our text for today. The Russians are coming. Now, why am I in this series? Let's go to the next slide here. Matthew 24 says this. This is part of what is called the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24 and 25. Uh, uh, Mark 13, Luke 21, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what we call the synoptic gospels. John's gospel is completely different. It, 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 it's a whole nother level, it's a whole nother way of writing. Um, but the Olivet Discourse, why do they call it the Olivet Discourse? Because Jesus ascended to the Mount of Olives and he taught his disciples. And he essentially taught them signs of the times. The end is near. He says, these are the signs that you should be looking for 
as the end draws near. So again, Matthew 24 and 25, the most extensive. Mark 13. Mark is the, is the shortest of all the Gospels. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Mark is the shortest of that. And then Luke, Luke tends to be quite detailed in a lot of different things because Luke is a doctor. He's a medical doctor. And he sees things from a detailed perspective. But uh, 24 and 25 of Matthew, 13 of, of Luke, and uh, 21 of, uh, excuse me, 13 of Mark, uh, 21 of Luke, we find this Olivet Discourse. And this is the gist, the genesis of this message that I'm preaching to you. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now, whether you're looking at your Bible or whether you've listened to your pastor through the years, what's the first thing that Jesus says of the signs of the time? What's the very first thing that comes out of Jesus' mouth when they ask him the question, what are going to be the signs? What's going to be the end of the age? Who can remember what Jesus said? Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Now, he then talks about earthquakes, famines, pestilence. He talks of world disorder. But the very first thing that Jesus says, the very first thing he says, don't be deceived. I find that telling. I find that fascinating. Yes. We should not be deceived. Again, why am I in this series? Luke 21, 34. Watch out. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Now you might say, yeah, that's probably not me. Okay, all right. Let's look at this last phrase, though. Don't let that day catch you unaware. Right. Now, no man knows the day nor the hour, the Bible right. says, of Jesus' return. But we will know the season. Yes. I believe we're in that season. I do believe we're in that season. Again, I believe one of the main reasons was why I preached to you last week. Russia becoming a nation. <laughs> Israel becoming a nation. May 14th, 1948. After thousands of years in exile. Israel becomes a nation. Israel has to become a nation for almost everything to be fulfilled. Right. That first has to be done. Don't let that day catch you unaware. God wants us to get ready, to get ready, to get ready. If yeah. you ever listen to the bishop, the bishop, T.D. Jakes, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready! Get ready, get ready, get ready! And he'll just march on us to get ready, get ready, ah! get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, ah! But we're a white church. Except for our dear sister, amen. Pray for God. Well, I can't Pray wait. I can't wait. As I've said before, when I go to heaven, the first billion years I'm hanging out in the hood. <laughs> I'll be the only white face there, but I'm going to be in the hood. My wife, for the first billion years, is going to be in the Latino section. Yep. And she's going to be salsa dancing. That's and, you right. know. But get ready. Get ready. Yes. Don't, don't let that unaware. day catch you unaware. Now under Putin's leadership, Russia is awakening <laughs> to a much greater place of power and threat of aggression. The greatest threat is still China. I believe China is spoken of in the end times because they're going to marshal 200 million troops. No nation can do that. But China can. China can do I believe there is symbol, symbols that would indicate China. The greatest threat right now is still China. I believe if China attacked America, I, I think we'd be toast or thrown. I think so too. I don't know that our, that our nation has a stomach for war. We're too, too individualized. We're too separated. And this is, this is why we have to fight. We have to fight this cancelism. Cancel culture. We have to fight hatred towards our fellow Americans. Yeah, yeah. That just plays into the enemy's hands. <laughs> so Russia is coming to a much greater world threat. And though world domination seems highly unlikely today, again, Russia is not as strong, near as strong as, as they were in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Even though Russia does not command world domination today, Ezekiel of old 
says Russia will be preeminent in the end times. Point number one. We're going to look at the Russian aggression. All right? Ezekiel predicted Russia's return to power in the latter days. And in those two chapters, 38 and 39 of his prophecy, he described the invasion of Israel by 10 different entities, including Russia and a coalition of essentially Muslim nations. Um, the Muslims do not like Israel. I mean, they control 99% of the Middle East. 99%, there's this little, and we'll be seeing some, some maps in a little bit, but they control 99% of the Middle East. And something you don't know, I've shared this with you before, do you know that every single day in Russia, every single day, there's missiles launched into that country by the Palestinians, by Hezbollah, um, you know, those who are going every single day, sometimes a couple of them, sometimes dozens of them, every single day. They have between 15 seconds and three minutes to be able to get into bomb shelters, to be able to hide. How would you like to go to work every single day or just be at your house every single day and know that very possibly today there might be a missile launched into my home, into my backyard, into my driveway? How would you like to live like that? No fun. No thank you, please. Now, the, the, the Israel, Israel has a marvelous uh, anti-missile defense system called the Iron Dome, where they can launch rockets to intercept these missiles. And the vast majority of them are intercepted, but again, many come in. Now, sometimes they're not big enough to destroy much more than a little area like this. They're very improvised, very crude, and then others are very sophisticated. But every single day, and the media will never cover that. Now, if, if Israel happens to kill somebody who's trying to attack, the whole media will, will cover that. But they will never, ever say, today there were 17 missiles launched into Israel. Today, uh, today there was six missiles launched into Israel. They'll, they'll never, ever mention it. But if Israel, by chance, seems to throw a rock back, the whole news is all over. They're so horrible. They are so awful. They are so cruel and mean-spirited. They build these huge walls. Yeah, because people would come across the border every day with suicide packs on them. Blow up people. Walls are good. Yeah. And if you don't think that's true, you're going to have a hard time with the New Jerusalem. Right. Huge walls. Huge walls. And the Bible says nothing impure shall ever That's right. it keeps out it enter. Right. I don't have any problem with walls. I don't have any problem with walls. They help define a nation. And this craziness of what's going on at our southern border. 1.8 million people coming across. None of them vaxxed. None of them vetted. 1.8 million have come across since the new year. That's insanity. Utter insanity. But here they are. That's a little segue there. Get back to the message, preacher. Okay. Ezekiel 38. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to God. God is not a nation. It's a title for a man, a, a person. It's a person. We might think of, uh, of a premier, of a president, of a prime minister. All right. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to God, this is what the sovereign Lord says, in that day when my people of Israel are living in safety, will you not take notice of it? You will come from your place in the far north. And there's only one nation to the furthest north of Israel, and that's going to be Russia. You will come from your place in the far north, you and many nations with you, all of them riding on horses, a great horde, a mighty army. You will advance against my people Israel like a cloud that covers the land. The Bible says there's going to be millions upon millions. In days to come, Gog, I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am proved holy. They're, they're under attack. They know that at any moment they can be invaded. And so they're on pins and needles. But there is coming a time where there's going to be a peace treaty and Israel is going to feel like, huh, who avoided this? 
man, it's a nice time to be alive. We don't have to worry about our enemies because there's going to be a, a treaty signed to essentially lay off of Israel. And now that treaty is going to be broken by the man of perdition, the Bible says. All right, so we haven't seen this yet, this unwalled area, a peaceful and unsuspecting people. But they're going to come to attack and take Israel's land. Secondly, they're going to take Israel's wealth, 38 and 12, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder. All right? They're not only going to take the land, they're going to take the wealth. And then thirdly, and here's the big one, 38 and 16, you will come against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. They're going to slaughter the Israel. That's their whole purpose is to destroy. Just as Hitler has tried and many others have tried to destroy the Jews. I mean, just go back into the Old Testament. Haman, who tried to develop this plan, you know, to, to destroy all the all the, uh, the 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 Jews, and the plot was found out, you know, and, and she went before the king and said, "Man, there's a plot underfoot to kill my people." People have hated the Jews. Everywhere they go, all through time, they have hated the Jews. Well, when is this going to take place? Here's when, 38 and 7. Get ready, be prepared, you and all the hordes gathered about you. After many days, you will be called to arms. In future years, you will invade a land that was recovered from war. We believe, I believe, this is when they say recover from war, from the Six-Day War where five nations surrounded Israel to destroy her in one day. And they had tens of thousands of tanks. They had thousands of planes. They had hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Israel was going to be wiped off the map. In one, two, three, four, five, six days, Israel absolutely smoked these nations. <laughs> smoked them, destroyed them, utterly destroyed their armies. It was, a, it was a modern day miracle. Yes, it was. But Ezekiel says they're going to attack a people who have recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations. Well, they've all come back to Israel. There's 8.5 million Jews in Israel. They come back from the diaspora. In other words, they've been scattered for centuries and millennia. And then God began bringing his people back. On May 14th, 1948, they became a nation. Now again, Ezekiel prophesies this 700 years before Jesus ever came on the scene. We're 2,000 years since then. So this is 2,700 years ago. Ezekiel could peer into the future, get his binoculars out, and say this is what's going to happen. They're going to come against this land that's recovered from war. We believe that six-day war, whose people have been gathered from the nations, which had long been desolate, and they had been brought out from the nations, and not all of them live in safety. Next slide. So again, when? Well, Israel has to be a nation. You know, they, they have to be a nation first. This can't be fulfilled unless Israel is a nation. When Israel is prosperous as well. You know that today Israel has the third most NASDAQ listed companies in the world, only behind the United States and China. This little itty bitty teeny weeny nation has the third most NASDAQ listed companies in the world. They're an economic juggernaut. This little size of New Jersey. The size of New Jersey. And they are third only behind US. United States and China. The, Israel has the largest number of startups per capita in the world, small business. And again, this is the lifeblood of America. And when you say you are not important, you are not significant, what was the word that was used during the pandemic? Um, essential. You're not essential. We're going to shut down these small businesses. You're not essential. No, no, no. Small businesses are the lifeblood of a free market enterprise. You can say what you want about capitalism. There's a lot of stones to be thrown at capitalism, but the free market enterprise, I, 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 I believe is biblical. It's God's plan. And so when you say you're not essential, not good. Do you know that Israel has the largest number of startups, in other words, small businesses per capita 
in the world. So they're going to attack Israel when Israel is a nation, when Israel is prosperous, and when Israel is at peace. Now, we don't see that yet, but here's what Daniel says, 9 and 27. He, in other words, the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many for one week. And so the Antichrist is going to broker this deal to essentially say, lay off Israel. Take your hands off, let her be. And then he's going to unleash the dogs at the other point. And they're going to come against Israel and surround her. So we've looked at the why. We've looked at the when as far as the Russians are coming. Let's look at the where. There is the Valley of Megiddo. You can see in the far area, airstrip. I used to wonder when I would read the Bible, and the Bible spoke of the millions upon millions upon millions. I thought, man, Israel's a small country. How can that be? And then we went up on top of Mount Carmel. And then you look down, and you look over this valley here, and this, this picture, it doesn't, doesn't show it justice, but how it spans actually over this way. I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer. It really spans over here. It's a large area, and you could absolutely positively have millions upon millions of troops that marshal from that area and then are sent out to destroy it. And there's already an airstrip there. There's already a military base there for the planes to come and land. So where is this going to be? This is going to be in the valley of Megiddo. So the why, the when, the where, the what. What is going to be the Russians' ultimate purpose? It's going to be destroy Israel. But instead of destroying Israel, God is going to thunder out of heaven and, and crush them. He's going to not only crush the Russians and these nations, the stands that are gathered together, the ultimate world nations will be gathered together. Sadly, America will probably be in there. We'll either throw our hat in or we'll be a, a, a country of non-significance. I'm not sure which it's going to be. But it, you know, America is not mentioned in the end times. And I said this before, but I'll say it again. I believe it's a couple of different things. We're either just... We're either just uh, sucked into a globalism. You know, you get your phones out right now, and you can look at beach cams in Australia. You can buy things from China. You can communicate with someone in South Africa instantaneously. Globalism, all right? And very possibly, we might just be sucked into a global political realm to where America is just one of many nations. That could be a possibility. Secondly, we can become a banana republic, a, a third world nation. Our country is quickly dissolving into a banana republic with the policies that are in place from this, from this current administration trying to destroy this nation. I don't want to be political, but this nation is being destroyed by policies. And we could end up just being like Guatemala. We could end up being like the Congo in Africa. We could just become an also-ran country to our world is just, our nation is just sucked in. Or we can be conquered by another nation. But America is not mentioned. But the Bible says that the world will surround Israel, that the nations will surround Israel. We already know these, this alliance that is here, and they're going to come against Israel to destroy them. But God is going to turn the tables and absolutely crush them. Ezekiel 39, 18. This is what will happen in that day. When Gog attacks the land of Israel, my hot anger will be aroused. How many of you, by a show of hands, ever had your mother or your father demonstrate hot anger towards you? Oh my. I mean, my mom's forehead would just be these veins in here, and, and she'd stomp through the house. You hear, she was a heel walker. And she'd go to the utility drawer to find a spatula or a wooden spoon or something. And the hot anger. All right. And when they attack the land of Israel, my hot anger will be aroused, declares the sovereign Lord, in my zeal and fiery wrath. Now, that's one thing for your parents or you as parents to have zeal and fiery wrath. <laughs> Towards your children. But imagine when God is burned up. 
I mean when God is just ticked off. In my zeal and fiery wrath, I will declare that at that time there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. Ezekiel, Revelation 16 speaks about that in, in graphic detail. Revelation 16. Ezekiel prophesies this 700 years before Christ. We're 2,000 years since Christ. When will this event actually occur? We don't know. But Ezekiel said it. John the Revelator recorded it. So there's at least a span of 2,700 years that speaks of this earthquake that'll be as no other earthquake ever in the history of humanity. Nothing will ever even remotely compare to this earthquake. That Ezekiel saw 27 years, 2,700 years ago, John saw 2,000 years ago, and who knows when it'll actually be. But in his fiery wrath and zeal, there is going to be an earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the beasts of the field, every creature that moves along the ground, and all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. It will be so devastating, so cataclysmic, that the Bible says in Revelation 16, islands will disappear. Literally, islands will disappear. He says in that earthquake, there will be demon spirits that look like frogs. Demon spirits are going to be unleashed upon the land. And God is going to smoke them. The fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the beasts of the field, every creature that moves along the ground, and all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. The mountains will be overturned, the cliffs will crumble, and every wall will fall to the ground. So great will it be. I will summon a sword against God on all my mountains, declares the sovereign Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. I will execute judgment on him with plague and bloodshed. Hundred pound, hundred pound hailstones of sulfur. My holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. Then they will know. It's going to look like all hope is gone. We're being surrounded by millions upon millions, tens of millions. All the nations have turned upon us. There is no hope. And God says, in my zeal and my fiery wrath, I'm going to destroy those who are trying to destroy me. And then you're going to know there's a God in Israel. You will know that there is a God. What's going to take place here again, as we just read? We see that there's going to be monumental convulsions. Next slide, please. An earthquake like never experienced in the history of humanity. There's going to be military confusion. Again, look at that passage. They're going to turn and attack each other. There's going to be major contagions, plagues, and dead bodies. Sulfuric hailstones. You know, we're in a pandemic. Five million people, tiddlywinks, child's play, has nothing compared to what will come up over here. And there's going to be multiple casualties. All the enemy is going to be wiped out. Not some, not most, or cause them to kind of back down. No, all the enemy is going to be wiped out. We looked at the why, we looked at the when, we looked at the where, we looked at the what. And then can you imagine? Can you imagine what's going to take place? Ezekiel 39 and 4. On the mountains of Israel you will fall, you and all your troops and the nations with you. I will give you as food to all kinds of carrion birds and to the wild animals. The birds and the beasts. Not the birds and the bees. The birds and the bees. These dead bodies are just going to be strewn. And can you imagine some hens of millions of dead bodies? in an area the size of New Jersey. Birds and wild animals are going to feast on these dead bodies. So the birds and the feast, the burnings, 
Ezekiel 39.9, those who dwell in the cities of Israel go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and arrows, the javelins and the spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years. Now again, what is the material that's going to be used here? We don't know. We don't know. Again, Ezekiel is looking at this from at least 2,700 years into the future. John speaks of this as well in Revelation. But they're just seeing things through their, their viewpoint of something far into the future when aircraft didn't exist, when tanks didn't exist, when satellites didn't exist, when nuclear weapons didn't exist. I mean, none of these things existed. What is going to be the burnings here? We don't exactly know. But the Bible says for seven years, they're going to be able to fuel and burn things for seven years. So the birds and the beasts, the burnings, and then the burials. I will give God a burial place there in Israel, and I will block the way of the travelers, because God and all his hordes will be buried there. So literally, vehicles trying to come and to go, to gather the bodies, to be able to rid the earth of the bodies, to be able to get the armaments, you know, all these things. There's going to be so many of them. The Bible just says, again, 27 years 2,700 years ago, they literally won't be able to fully get there because of all the bodies. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. That's a long time. A long time to be gathered and to be buried. And what is going to be the end result of all of this? And then we, we wrap up here. What's going to be the end <coughs> result of all of this? Ezekiel 39, 21. I will display my glory among the nations. You know, again, 2,700 years ago, you, you couldn't imagine this. Just pick up your phone right now and you can see all of it. Nothing you can't see. Nothing you can't observe. Nothing you can't buy. I will dis display my glory among the nations. And all the nations, all the world, will see the punishment I inflict and the hand I lay on them. From that day forward, the people of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God. Now, it's going to take something so cataclysmic, so god-awful for them to awaken like He is the God of Israel. The one that we crucified, the one that we had a false trial for, the one that we mocked and spat at, the one that we pierced and beat. He is the Savior. The people of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God. I will now restore the fortunes of Jacob and will have compassion on all the people of Israel and I will be zealous for my holy name. When I have brought them back from the nations and have gathered them from the countries of their enemies, I will be proved holy through them in the sight of many nations. The last verse. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. I will no longer hide my face from them, for I will pour out my spirit on the people of Israel, declares the sovereign Lord. God is going to come near to this beleaguered nation. We were in Israel for the 68th anniversary of, uh, of their nation. In America, when we have the 4th of July, there's a lot of barbecuing that goes on and uh, a lot of gatherings. There's parades. Um, you know, there, there's fireworks, and I think there's patriotism. I know for me, I, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of an emotional day for me. I love our country. I adore our country. This is still the greatest country on the face of the earth. There's nothing that even compares to America. And again, practical. How do we know that America is the greatest nation on the face of the earth? 
It's a real simple thing. Just in the last 10 months, 1.8 million people tried to come to this nation. Name one other country on the face of the earth. Ask all 7 billion people on the face of the earth. Ask them this question. Name one other country where 1.8 million people have come in the last 10 months. And 7 billion people would not be able to answer that question correctly unless they said the United States of America. So are they coming because this is a, a god-awful country? Are they coming because this is a racist, a systemically racist country? Couldn't be further from the truth. Why would 1.8 million people, almost all of them brown and black, 85% of them, why would they come to a horrible, god-awful country? You know, I mean, just, just think with me on this. And the people who rag on this nation, who crack on this, who say it's a horrible, it's a racist nation, it's god awful, go somewhere else, please. And let me take you to the airport. I'll drive you there to the airport. This is the greatest nation on the face of the earth. No one even compares to this nation. And why are they not exiting? If it's so bad, why are they not exiting at such a rate? Because they can't find any place better. But we're in Israel. I say all this to say this. I'm kind of emotional on the 4th of July. I mean, I'm, I'm waving the flag. I'm, I'm loving our country. All of its problems included. I'm loving our country. But in Israel, oh, it's really patriotic. I mean, it's really patriotic. And we are there for the 68th anniversary. And I'll never forget, we were down in the Mediterranean. It was probably about 95 degrees. Just a brilliant day, no humidity, about 95 degrees, crystal clear skies. And we were there at the beach, and they were just having a processional of ships and helicopters and planes and bombers, and you know, just and just this huge celebration, a parade of all their armament. Well, we kind of do that in America to a degree, um, in, in Washington maybe, um, but I'll never forget talking to an engineer and his wife. Beautiful couple, beautiful couple. And this engineer, that chokes me up to even think about it, with tears streaming down his face, he says, you are the best friends that this nation has. Thank you for being a friend. Now we were there and we were instructed by our, our, our leaders to endeavor to witness, and, and more than anything to witness, to thank the Israelites, because they're the ones that gave us the Bible. They're the ones that gave us the Ten Commandments. You know? And in us thanking them, he says, in tears, he says, you don't know what it's like to be hated by everybody. And everyone around them. I mean, Jordan is kind of peaceful with them. Lebanon is, is somewhat peaceful. Egypt is somewhat peaceful. But that whole region by and large, hates them. The world, by and large, hates the Israelites. And he says, you don't know what it means to be hated by everyone. Thank you for being a friend to Israel. God is going to come near to this nation. And he's going to show himself mighty. He's going to show himself holy. He is going to show himself to be the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He is going to come near. Let's stand together. And I want us, you know, I opened with a couple of verses this morning. We don't want to be caught unawares. We want to be wise to the signs of the times. We want to be as the wise virgins who trim their lamps and who add oil. And they were ready when the bride came. I do not want to be the foolish virgins who were just kind of asleep at the wheel thinking, eh, let's eat, drink, and be merry. Let, let's go on with life. We don't know when Jesus will appear. And there's nothing that can has to be fulfilled for him to appear again. That's right. He can come today, and wouldn't that be something? Yeah. But I want to be found ready.